Thanks for joining us. This is Ears to Hear, a podcast brought to you by the 25th Street Church of Christ in Columbus, Indiana. Check us out online at 25thstreetchurchofchrist.com for directions and meeting times. We appreciate you tuning in. Now, let's get into God's Word with Ears to Hear. Welcome to another episode of Ears to Hear. My name is John Hines. I am the host for this podcast. I am the preacher for the Church of Christ that meets at 25th Street in Columbus, Indiana. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for for this episode. Well, this is, I believe, this is our fourth episode. Um, last week we talked about about what Jesus did before he went to the cross. Sometimes when people think about Jesus. All they really think about is is him going to the cross, or, or perhaps the empty tomb. But what we need to understand is that Jesus did a lot of things before he ever went to the cross. That he taught people. He taught people, he rebuked sin. We talked about that. That he did something that so many people are not willing to do today. That he actually rebuked sin. He actually warned people about the consequences of their actions. And he promised. He made, he made so many promises that if we would listen to him, if we would follow him, that, that we would find rest for our souls. Remember what he said when he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and, and heavy laden. Right, Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. You will find rest for your souls. That's a promise that he has made to us that if we will come to him and respect his authority and and actually do what he tells us to do. And I know that sounds very simple, but that idea of we don't just call him Lord, but we actually do his will. If we'll do those things, then the promises are assured. Well, what we're going to talk about today is as we think about what Jesus did before he ever went to the cross, one of the things that he did right from the get-go, is found in Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, it's the account, John the Baptist has already started his ministry. He's been teaching, he's been preaching, right? We know that. It talks about, talks about his disciples. So even John the Baptist did more than just baptize. He was teaching, he was preaching, but he was baptizing. And it talks about how, I believe it says, all of Jerusalem or all of Judea came out to him to be baptized, confessing their sins. And that's in Matthew chapter 3 at verse 5. It says that. Well, lo and behold, as everyone else came out to be baptized, as so many came out confessing their sins, doing this, and as John was at a certain place, well, lo and behold, guess who else comes to be baptized? And it's Jesus. In John, or pardon me, in Matthew chapter 3 at verse 13, let's read a little bit. In Matthew 3 at verse 13, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said, um, Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now when we think about baptism, and baptism we are commanded to be baptized today. Right? We know what Acts 2 verse 38 says, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. We understand why we need to be baptized for the remission of our sins. We need our sins washed away. Ananias came in and told Saul of Tarsus, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Call upon the name of the Lord. Have your sins washed away. I believe that's in Acts chapter 22, if I'm remembering correctly, when Paul is recounting it. We understand why we need to be baptized. But what I wanted for us to think about for just a few minutes is, why did Jesus need to be baptized? Surely it was not to wash away his sins because he hadn't sinned. 
He had not sinned. So why did Jesus, why was Jesus baptized? That's the question that I would like for us to think about for just a few minutes. And I I appreciate you tuning in. And we'll start with this. Very simply, to think about it, Jesus answers the question for us. Because John the Baptist, John the Baptist gives the, he, he frankly, he gives the, the logical answer when Jesus comes to him to be baptized. John tries to prevent him, and John says, I need to be baptized by you. You might think about that. That's interesting, because that shows John the Baptist, even though he had been baptizing, he had not been baptized. That in and, in and of itself is quite interesting. And, and of course, we are here, we are on this the other side of the cross, if you understand what I mean by that. Um, But anyway, John gives the reasonable response. He says, he says, I need to be baptized by you and you're coming to me. And Jesus answers him. And Jesus says, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. That is why Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And let's think about that, because I think a lot of times, as as you consider, as we consider that concept, a a lot of times people are not interested in fulfilling all righteousness. They're interested in fulfilling maybe a little bit of righteousness. They're interested in fulfilling half, half of the righteousness that the Lord has for them. You remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, what, what do I need to do? And Jesus said, you know the law. And, and he recites part of it. And the rich young ruler says, well, all these things I've kept from my youth. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. I believe in Mark's gospel it says, looked at him and loved him and said, one thing you still lack. One thing you lack. And he says, go, sell what you have, give to the poor and come and follow me. But that that individual, the rich young ruler, was lacking. And according to Jesus, he was lacking in one area. And I think a lot of people are content to be lacking in one area. Well, Jesus could not be lacking in one area. He was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And we need to make sure that we are not lacking in one area. In Paul's letter to Timothy, he talks about that all Scripture is breathed out by God and is given and is profitable for reproof, rebuke, right? For all those things that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Complete. That idea of completion, a lot of folks are not interested in that. They're not interested in fulfilling all righteousness. But Jesus was. And that's why Jesus was baptized. I think he was also baptized as we think about it, right? Why was Jesus baptized? And we know it, and it's one of the most interesting verses that Jesus, in in Scripture it says that he learned obedience even unto the point of death. He learned obedience. For the heavens to open up in this passage in Matthew as Jesus was baptized, and for the voice to come from heaven, the heavenly Father, for him to say, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Well, what that is, think about this. Think about this idea. For Jesus to do this, let me just ask it this way. Was Jesus doing the Father's will here? The answer to that is yes. He was doing the Father's will. And in that, we see what that must mean is that God wanted him to do this. Jesus was baptized in obedience. Right? As we considered, he was baptized in obedience. He learned obedience, even to the point of death, but that learning obedience started a long time before this, a long time before this, he learned obedience. And in obeying the Father, he was well-pleasing to him. Jesus, as he's talking to John the Baptist, though, he also says, he says, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting. And we'll stop for a moment. And I just love it how, how gentle Jesus is with John. And you might remember, John is his relative, Okay, 
He's his relative, and John's just a little bit older than Jesus, just a few months older. And John is, John has a hard job. He has a hard job. As he came preparing the way of the Lord, making the path straight. And I just love it that Jesus says, permit it to be so now. Permit it to be so. John says, I have no business baptizing you. And Jesus says, permit it to be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. For us. As we think about, just think about that idea of for us. And it's just a wonderful thing that everything Jesus does, think about his role as mediator. As he mediates, there is, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus what scripture says he is serving us he's serving his father of course but he's also serving us he's giving us an example this is my body which is given for you he's giving all through his ministry he's giving examples for us he's doing everything he's doing he's doing for us now i'm not saying that it should become me centered worship that's not what I'm saying. In, in, in the same sense, for example, consider, consider the parable of the lost sheep. The shepherd goes looking for the sheep. Now, what is the shepherd looking for? The sheep, obviously. So does that mean the whole story is about the sheep? No, the, we give glory to God. We give glory to Jesus. We recognize He is the center of our attention. But at the same time, we recognize that he is doing these things for us. It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Even John the Baptist. Just the, the wonderful idea that the Lord works with us and for us. Think about the church being the body of Jesus. We recognize he is the head of the church. Right? But he uses us. He has fellowship with us. We abide in him and he abides in us. That is the relationship that we have. It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. We might also think about, in answering our question, why was Jesus baptized? I think there's also an element of we need to think about who was watching. Because these things were not being done in a vacuum. And we, we think about who was watching. We think about what John the Baptist's job was as he talks about it. And, and when we look in the Gospel of John, uh, I want you to consider what, what is said. Okay, This is John chapter 1, and this is John's account of Jesus' baptism. Chapter 1, verse 29, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit. And listen, John says, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit alighted upon him like a dove, and the voice came from heaven. John says, all this was being done. When John says, I did not know him, again, they were relatives. He's not saying he had never heard of Jesus. They were relatives. He's saying that what the Father did and the Holy Spirit did when Jesus was baptized, that it confirmed that, yes, his relative, Jesus, the Son of Mary, was in fact the Son of God, the Messiah. That is all. All of that is encompassed within why Jesus was baptized. John says, I have seen and testified of this. We should also not discount the Holy Spirit 
lighting upon him. In Luke's account, in Luke chapter 4, as we think about it, in Luke chapter 4, in the account, and you might just, just consider, as the Holy Spirit lighted upon him, after, and in Luke's account, in Luke 3 verses 21 and 22 is when it talks about the Holy Spirit descending upon him, Luke 4 verse 1, after the genealogy is given of Jesus, it says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And then you have the temptation. It looks like this is when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. Jesus was going to do the miracles, he says, by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit. And it looks like the Holy Spirit came upon him. What was happening at the baptism it was not just a show. All right? Things were happening. The Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. And here in Luke, it looks like this. It says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So all of that goes into why was Jesus baptized. And it's just an interesting thing for us to consider and for us to think about and study about. I hope you found it interesting just to think about why was Jesus baptized? Because it certainly was not for the remission of our sins that he did it for these reasons. Fulfilling all righteousness in obedience, doing it for us, giving us an example, and we think about who was, who was looking on as John testified. But I, I, I hope you appreciated that brief study. I hope you're, hope you're having a good week. In the news, you know, on these podcasts, we usually try to break it up half and half, do a, a Bible study in the first half and in the back half. It's still a Bible study, but we try to talk about things that have been in the news. And one of the things that's been in the news these last few days, uh, we might talk about politics again next week. We'll see. I'm not making any promises about that. But one of the things that's been in the news this past week was this was the Super Bowl. This past Sunday night was the Super Bowl. Perhaps you watched it as the Kansas City Chiefs got demolished by Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, perhaps you watched it. A lot of folks, a lot of folks did. A lot of folks taped it. I hope you did not skip church to watch the Super Bowl. That would not be, that is not a good thing, um, but perhaps you recorded it and, and watched it later on. Um, but in, in thinking about sports, I, I wanted to share a quick clip with you, a uh, little, little article that someone had shared with me, and the title of it is Church Like Football. And hopefully you get a chuckle out of this, but anyway, the title is, Is Church Like Football? Well, there's a pregame show. And in church, it's the last-minute chaos to get to services not on time. <clears throat> and that certainly does happen from fairly frequently. Uh, is church like football? Well, there's offsides when members are not sitting in their usual pews. Uh, there's coin toss when half-hearted or no-hearted contributions when the collection plate is passed around. Uh, there's personal fouls, um, as in football, also in the church. There's a personal foul whenever the preacher says anything that offends someone. That's personal foul, in case you didn't know it. Uh, there are timeouts in church as well, in case you didn't know. That's when you're uh, taking a nap or naps during the sermon. Uh, there's sudden death, and that's when the preacher goes about five minutes over his normal time during a sermon. That's sudden death as in football, as in, as in church. There's the two-minute warning when the preacher begins his invitation, uh, signaling everyone to get their songbooks, um, start wrapping up, right? That's the two-minute warning. There's the blitz. That's when people rush for the door after the closing prayer. And then the article closes out with, well, there's a halfback. You know, in football, there's the halfback. In church, it's the number of people who return on Sunday evening. Uh, in football, there's the quarterback. Uh, in church, the quarterback is the number of people who return on Wednesday evening. And then there's the post-game show. And in church, that's the gossip about other members at Sunday lunch. Anyway, kind of a ugh, little poignant article there, or a brief little, brief little tidbit. Maybe you got a chuckle out of that. 
Yeah, maybe not so much. I don't know, but I thought it was thought it was worth sharing. But anyway, as you as you think about sports and you think about the Super Bowl, you, you know there are lessons that we can learn that that we understand when it comes to sports, but sometimes. When it comes to spiritual matters, we, we think that it works differently. And it's just simply, sometimes it's just simply not the case. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, when Paul's writing to the young, the young preacher, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and he's trying to encourage Timothy, is what he's trying to do. But in 2 Timothy 2 at verse 5, Paul says, and he uses a couple of different metaphors. One metaphor is the the soldier engaged in warfare. That's in verse 4. But in verse 5, he says also, and also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. He's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. We understand that in sports. When, When athletes... You know, think about in in recent years, Lance Armstrong, who won all of those, you know, the Tour de France multiple times. And he was just, he was idolized by so many for years until he was caught, until he was caught. And then he's not idolized anymore. We expect athletes to compete according to the rules. Well, the point that Paul is making is it's the same way in serving the Lord. There are rules. We, w- there are rules. We respect the rules, and we understand we need to abide by those rules. If people think, right, we understand that in the sports world, cheaters should be punished. But yet somehow in spiritual matters, we think sometimes that people think they can behave however they want, that they can worship however they want, that they can do whatever they want throughout the week, and then on Sunday come and get churched up and everything's going to be okay. They think they can break the rules. Paul tells Timothy, you don't get crowned unless you obey the rules. And there are rules. There are commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We understand that in the sports world. There are rules. Let's make sure we understand it in the spiritual world realm as well. Another aspect of sports is we actually have a a player coach. You know, sometimes coaches in sports, sometimes they don't, they were not players themselves. And sometimes the players lose respect for them because of that. Other times, though, they actually played the sport and they understand the ins and outs and they understand what it was like actually playing the sport. Well, that's basically what we have in Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews 12 at verse 1, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It's a sports analogy. Run the race that is set before us. Laying aside the weight. Laying aside the sin as well. Run with endurance. Verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. We have a player coach. As we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, he sympathizes with us. He has has done what we are doing. When the word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? This is what allows him to sympathize with us. Okay, He was tempted as we are tempted, yet he did not sin. We recognize Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. And he is, in a sense, our, he is a player coach. You might consider it, and you might consider that's who we look to. A lot of people, they're not looking to the coach. They're looking to their moms or their dads. They're looking to their friends. They're looking to they're looking to some preacher, some pastor, okay? 
I'll tell you right now, as, as much as we try to help one another, we are not Jesus. There's only one Jesus. There's only one Lord. And we need to recognize that idea. We look unto him as the author and the finisher of the faith. We also recognize one of the sports analogies that's used in Scripture. We, we actually have to train and play. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul talks about, he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. It's talking about boxing. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others I myself have, should have, pardon me, lest when I preach to others I myself should become disqualified. There's actually a number of lessons we can learn from that. As you think about the idea, it, it is not enough to just believe in the game. You know, I, I read about the Super Bowl, or I heard a heard an article, or heard an interview about the Super Bowl. Tom Brady, throughout the last part of the season, he kept texting his teammates saying, we're going to win this game. We're going to win this game. Well, that's, that's well and good. That's fine. They, that, that's fine. We understand that. But at some point, you actually have to play the game. It's not enough to just believe you're going to win. You actually have to discipline yourself. You actually have to practice moderation, temperance, abstinence, you know, all those things. You actually have to discipline yourself, and you actually have to play the game. You actually have to compete, and here it talks about running. You actually have to do those things. And you also, at this verse talks about when Paul says, lest I should become disqualified. You have to play four quarters. You have to play the whole game. That's, that's what we are called to do. We understand that in the sports world. But sometimes we lose sight of that in the spiritual world. You have to play four quarters. How many games have been lost right at the end? You know, sometimes you'll see football players as they're running for the end zone, and you'll see them, they'll start hot-dogging it into the end zone, and they don't see that person coming up behind them ready to swat the football away. If that player swats the football away, before they break the plane of the end zone, does it count as a touchdown? Nope. You have to run through the finish line. You have to play all four quarters. You have to play all nine innings. That's what you have to do. We have to be faithful until death. In Philippians chapter 3, in Philippians 3, Paul uses this sports metaphor. Philippians 3 at verse 12, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. Right? Verse 13, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's what we have to do. We have to compete. It's not enough just to believe. Nothing wrong with believing. We need to believe. But we also need to discipline, and we also need to compete. That is what Jesus did, our player coach. That is what we need to do as well, as we look unto him and we abide by the rules. Sometimes what happens is people focus on the wrong game. And in Ephesians, it talks about that. In Ephesians chapter 6, at verse, Ephesians chapter 6, at verse 12, he says, For we do, not we do not wrestle. It's a sports analogy. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now I'm starting to mix metaphors, I know. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We need to back up. 
We need to see the big picture. And we need to see who the players really are. Okay? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Paul, when he's writing, when he's writing to Timothy again, and, and it's in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he talks, about, he talks about that he had finished the race. He had run the race. He was being poured out as a drink offering. But that's, that's what we have to do. We have to finish the race, and we have to finish it faithfully. I appreciate you joining us for this podcast. I hope these thoughts have been beneficial to you as, we think, as we've thought about the sports world and, and we see those metaphors used in Scripture. The reason those sports metaphors are used in Scripture is because sports was just as popular back then as it, was, as it is today. You know, the whole Olympics and all that started back then. And you had a lot of folks who were interested in sports. And Paul uses those metaphors to help them to understand these spiritual ideas. So I hope it's been beneficial to you thinking about those ideas and in thinking about Jesus and why Jesus was baptized. And you might consider Jesus again being baptized. He had to play according to the rules. He looked unto his father, certainly. He had to discipline himself, and he actually had to bear his cross. He had to do it. And he had to be faithful. He had to, he had to play the whole game. He had to be faithful until death. Appreciate you tuning in. It's just me this week. Pardon me for not having a guest or a, or a co-host on today. Uh, due to the weather here in Columbus, it's been kind of hit and miss with folks getting out. But I, so it's just me. Sorry about that. Uh, but I appreciate you tuning in. Hope you're able to catch next week's podcast as well. Thanks for being with us.